that everybody comes on Wednesday nights. And of course, there's always plenty of brownies. If there's no other reason to learn Torah, there are brownies. So that's tonight's Wednesday night. Friday night, that's the day after tomorrow, is Rimonim, our monthly service of uh, music and joy and spiritual and spirit. It'll be in this room at 6.30 p.m., preceded by a kind of a heavy snack for those of you who like to have a little Shabbos snack before you pray. Um, so come at 6.30 and enjoy beautiful Shabbat music. Saturday morning, Torah study at 9 o'clock. Sunday morning, this Sunday morning, we welcome to VBS Rabbi Gershon Sizomu. Rabbi Gershon Sizomu is the chief rabbi of Uganda. Look at me and say, Uganda? Let me do that again. Rabbi Sizomu is the chief rabbi of Uganda. <laughs> yes, it's right. Tribes of Africans converted to Judaism during the 20th century. And Rabbi Sazom was the great, great nephew of the founder of this movement, the founder of these tribes. He is ordained at the American Jewish University. I was there. I actually taught him. And now he is not only the leader of the Abu Yadaya community in Uganda, he's also a member of the Ugandan parliament and a human rights activist around the world. He's going to be here at VBS to teach our kids at 10.30 in the morning. He will do a session for grown-ups, tell us the story of his tribe, the story of his people, the struggle of being Jewish in Uganda, in Africa, and, uh, and elsewhere. And then right after that, after his talk, he's going to lead the Hebrew school kids in their morning tefillah. So we'll get to hear some of the melodies, beautiful, beautiful melodies, African Jewish melodies the way Jews should pray. Um, and you'll be able to enjoy that beautiful music. So 10.30 this Sunday morning, and it's enjoyable. It's open to everybody. A couple of other dates to put on your calendar. So far we got this, right? So today's Wednesday, Friday's Rimonim, Shabbos is Torah study, Sunday. You can just stay. You don't have to leave. Sunday's Rabbi uh, Suzomu. On November 27th, we're going to have a, a continuation of our political discussion Three of the founders of the National Jewish Republican Coalition uh, will be with us, the Republican Jewish Coalition, it's called, will be with us to talk about the Republican Party, American conservatism in the age of Trump. We actually gave it a more kitschy name. We called it the elephants in the room. Um, but the guys who were speaking wanted it formal. So it's American conservatism, the Republican Party in the age of Trump. Um, very articulate, wonderful, sensitive guys who really understand um, a vision of America that we're going to share together. Everybody's invited for that. And later that week on the 30th, which I think is Thursday that week, uh, we join with Americans for Peace Now, and we'll have the Washington correspondent of Haaretz speaking to us about Israel and the United States in the age of Trump as well. All of that's on the website. All the details are there. We hope that you'll make it your business to come and join us for all of those wonderful opportunities to learn and to grow. Before we get started, let's all rise from our seats. Turn to the folks beside you and say, good evening. Welcome. Nice to have you here. Hi, David. Hello, hello. Right. Now, put your arms about each other and draw each other close. We give thanks for the opportunity to learn together. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kidshanu Mitzvotav Etzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. Yaase Shalom, Yaase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu V'yal Kol Yisrael. Yaase Shalom, Yaase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu V'yal Kol Yisrael. Yaase Shalom, Yaase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu V'yal Kol Yisrael. Yaase Shalom. Yaase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu V'yal Kol Yisrael. Yaase Shalom, Yaase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu V'yal Kol Yisrael. That works better. Please be seated. Good, no problem. Good. This week we are, this year, we are studying as quickly as we can the history Hello? of the Jewish people. This is not going to fit, but 
No, it's not going to fit. This one's okay now? The history of the oh, Jewish people. This one's okay now. All right. The history of the Jewish people. There Are you guys okay over there? Can they you hear? Can hear? They can hear. Right. Thank you. You begin a study of the history of the Jewish people by opening the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew Bible is our principal text to tell us what happened to the Jewish people in the early generations of, their, of our existence. More than that, it tells us what they were thinking. It's not just history as events, it's history as ideas, history as identity. In those days, we were a people on a land, we had a government, we had a king, and the king's actions shaped the identity of people. To call yourself a Jew meant you lived in Judea, you paid taxes to the government, you served in his army, you were loyal to the king. In order to reinforce the sense of citizenship as identity, the temple of Jerusalem, the principal religious institution of that moment, was directly across the street from the palace of the king. So one offers one's service to God and one pays one's taxes to the king. And it's the king who determines the shape of policy, but more than that, it's the king who determines the shape of identity, of identity. But it's not just the king. There's a second personality, a second principal Jewish personality of the time who has, in many ways, even a more decisive effect in the long term on the identity of the people of Israel, on how Jews think about themselves, how they understand their identity, their mission in the world, their place in front of God. And that character is unique to Jewish civilization. There is no one like this character in any other civilization, Middle East or any place else, and that is the Navi, the prophet. Lots of civilizations had and have soothsayers, fortune tellers, pundits, editorial writers, real news, fake news, take your choice. But nobody had a character like the prophet, a human being who was infused with a sense of conscience, who spoke truth to power as a profession. And it's the prophet and the prophet's, the prophet's rough and tumble relationship with the king, the argument, the tension between them that shapes the biblical narrative that shapes the biblical period, that shapes what we learned from the Bible. And tonight, we're going to examine the prophet. We're going to take a look at one prophet in particular, one of the most remarkable Jews who ever lived, whose vision of the world, whose understanding of Israel, whose understanding of the Jewish people, whose relationship with God is both unique but formative for the way Jews would see themselves for the rest of history. And that fellow's name was Jeremiah. Jeremiah is, in many ways, the last prophet before the destruction and the first prophet of the rest of Jewish history. And our guide tonight is someone who is, an, who is, an, who is really an authority on this prophet because she's written two books about this prophet. Rabbi Zoe Klein is the rabbi of Temple Isaiah, which is our neighbor right across the street, over across the hill, past the tree, down to the left. It's a beautiful place, just don't try to park there. It's true, it's like you can't park, I mean, it's terrible. Uh, a wonderful congregation. Now, tonight we, we have to celebrate with Rabbi Klein because she's not only the senior rabbi of Temple Isaiah, which is a major congregation in our community, not only a recognized author and a, authority and scholar, not only the most poetic rabbi I've ever met ever in LA or any place else, but tonight she's a newlywed. Oh. Oh. And, um, and her husband is hiding in the back of the room. This is my old friend Scott, who showed up one day at work. We, we work together often um, because Scott works at Mount Sinai Memorial Park taking care of families. And he said to me once, he said to me, remember what you said to me? He said, what's it like to date a rabbi? He asked me this question, and I said, lucky man. <laughs> you whisper sweet things in her ear in Aramaic, <laughs> right? Try it. And so then he comes back, he says, you were right, it worked. <laughs> and then he comes back and says, we're engaged. And I said, no, you're kidding, really? He said, yeah. And, and then they got married. So we want to welcome Scott and Rabbi Zoe 
And on behalf of the Valley Best Shalom community, Simen Tov, O Mazel Tov, O Mazel Tov, O Simen Tov, Simen Tov, O Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov, O Simen Tov, Simen Tov, O Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov, O Simen Tov, Yehelanu, 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 O Lechol Yisrael, Yehelanu, Yehelanu, O lechol Yisrael, hoi David melech Yisrael, chai v'kayam. David melech Yisrael, chai v'kayam. We're throwing candy at Scott, you should know that. So welcome, we're delighted you're here. Rabbi Klein has written two wonderful books about the prophet Jeremiah. The first book she wrote was called Drawing in the Dust which is a marvelous story about an archaeological excavation that finds the ancient scroll of Jeremiah. It's a wonderful, it's sort of a novel, historical novel, historical meditation. I got 20 pages into the book, and that's the first scene where there's sex. And I said to myself, she enjoyed her Bible classes in seminary a lot more than I enjoyed mine. <laughs> boy, oh boy. I mean, it's sort of like, 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 the Tanakh meets Fifty Shades of Gray. It was just, it was Fifty Shades of Blue and White is what it was. Woo. I mean, I, and I, it, it motivated me to read the rest of the book, you know. I a, like, I woke up Nina and I said, listen to this, you know. And she said, what are you reading? I said, I'm reading Zoe. She said, go to sleep, you know. So it's, and then what, what she did after, in the, in the novel, in the novel, the archaeologist discovers a scroll. So then Zoe went back and she wrote the scroll. And this one's called the scroll of Anatia, right? That's how you say it? Which is the scroll that the archaeologist, it's sort of like finding the thing that Indiana Jones found, which is a wonderful, a, also a wonderful meditation on the book of Jeremiah, the character of Jeremiah. And I thought there's nobody better to introduce us to this wonderful character. So please welcome, right? Please welcome Rabbi Zoe. What do we call you now? Rabbi Zoe? <laughs> Zoe Klein-Miles. A little longer than we usually give an introduction. No, this is great. Give me a five-minute warning also. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to lift this up because if this is the microphone, you have to speak into like okay. a lollipop. All right. Well, I can hold it also if there's a problem. All right. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to be back and to see all of you. Thank you so much. It's really, it's great to see you. You know, I was actually here years ago. I know the last prophet who I spoke about at uh, VBS was the prophet Jonah. And I had so much fun talking with you about Jonah. And I learned a lot in preparing for that. But before that, years ago, I did speak about Jeremiah once before. I don't know if anyone here remembers my talk on Jeremiah. The hope is that you don't. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, because I thought about that. I thought, what if I gave the exact same talk on Jeremiah? Would anybody know? Um, but I don't like doing that, and plus I couldn't find it in my computer. And, you know, you have a rabbi, Rabbi Feinstein, who's just so incredible, and he's a storyteller, he's a historian, he's a leader, he's a visionary, he's a rabbi's rabbi, a leader's leader, and so what I decided for tonight to do something different, because I've spoken with you before, is instead of dwelling too much on the history of Jeremiah, I'll do a little brief overview, I wanted to talk about Jeremiah from the perspective that I love. So when I wrote about Jeremiah, the one thing that is different than um, what Rabbi Feinstein said is that I actually wrote the scroll uh, before I wrote Drawing in the Dust. So I wrote this scroll. It is 52 chapters long, and it is about a woman who is madly in love with the prophet Jeremiah and, and basically stalks him. And so every verse, the book of Jeremiah is 52 chapters long. Every verse of Jeremiah is mirrored from her perspective. And I wrote that, and I was kind of in like a year-long trance writing it. I was just madly in love with the prophet Jeremiah. I mean, as much in love as a person living in the same time period with another person. Just extremely, this was before I had, before I got married, before I had children, before I got divorced, before I got married, before a lot of things <laughs> happened. Um, my first great love was Jeremiah. And I want to introduce him to you through the eyes of someone who was madly, passionately in love with him. 
Um, but a little, so when I, wrote, when I wrote this though, I talked to people about it, I talked to editors, I talked to agents, and everyone said, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, it reads like a book of the prophets, but who reads the prophets? So that's when I decided to create an archeologist to discover the scroll that I had already written. And that was the birth of the book, Drawing in the Dust. So just a little bit of background, just an overview on who Jeremiah is. Jeremiah, his ministry is from 627 BCE, and it goes for about 40 years. So he's a prophet for about 40 years, and he sees a lot. He's a prophet in the time of King Josiah. King Josiah is really interesting because King Josiah's grandfather, Manasseh, King Manasseh, actually led the whole land into hedonism and idolatry and turned them away from Adonai. And Josiah saw that the people needed to be reformed, that the people needed a centralized worship, and that they needed... Um, to return to their roots, which was monotheism. And so Josiah cleansed the land. There's a really fascinating study. It, actually, it's in the book of Kings where there's a strange mention of King Josiah commissioning a scroll to be brought. It, it, it's very strange. There's a kind of transfer of money that seems a little bit questionable. And it seems that he commissioned a scroll that would be able to be read to the land to all the people to reform them and to bring them back. And that scroll was the scroll of Deuteronomy. So it's really, it's controversial because Deuteronomy reads differently than the other four books of Torah, but that's in Josiah's time. He wanted a scroll that summarized our history to be able to read to the people, to bring them back to be one person, to one, one community. So Jeremiah witnessed the Reformation. He witnessed the death of Josiah. He witnessed the downfall of the Assyrian Empire around the same time. He witnessed the destruction of the Jewish, Jewish state by the Babylonians. And he witnessed the exile of the entire people out of Israel to Babylonia. And he himself escaped with a remnant into Egypt, and he actually died in Egypt. So he saw an incredible period, as Rabbi Feinstein said, the, the end of a certain period and the beginning of another. Um, so he's really extraordinary. I, so why did I love Jeremiah? I gave you some texts that are Jeremiah, and I wanted to share with you some of the poetry that I wrote that relates to each one of these texts that I shared. Jeremiah, when you think of a Jeremiah, you think of a, someone who is woeful, a woeful complainer. Right, someone who is really miserable, heartbroken, sad. And Jeremiah talks, he, he's miserable. It's no fun being a prophet, right? We, we want to be leaders, but nobody really should want to be a prophet. It's a terrible, terrible thing. It means imagine going to High Holy Days and standing up on your chair and telling everybody that they're corrupt, interrupting everything, telling them that they're hypocrites, telling them that... Uh, Terrible things are going to befall them, God forbid. Not a popular voice. And when you're a prophet, you don't have a choice but to say those things because you are marionetted, you're puppeteered by God. So you're not even speaking in your own voice. Um, we criticize Jonah for running away, and we think that he wasn't a good prophet. But it's, it's a terrible thing to, to lose your voice and to be controlled and to have to speak these horrible things to people that maybe you love. So I wanted us to look at our, our papers and look at the words of Jeremiah, the opening chapter of Jeremiah. So it's on page 1, chapter 1. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anatote, skipping. I'm going to skip along because we don't have all night. So I'm just going to skip through. The words of the Lord came to me. Before I created you in the womb, I selected you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet concerning the nations. I replied, Lord God, ah, Lord God, I don't know how to speak, for I'm still a boy. And the Lord said to me, don't say I'm still a boy, but go wherever I send you and speak whatever I command you. Have no fear of them, for I am with you. The Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Herewith I put my words into your mouth. Okay, so I wanted to create a girl that was there at every step of the way along with Jeremiah. What would it look like from her perspective, this scene, how cinematography, how would you film this scene? What would it look like? And what if you were there? And what if you, like me, were in love with this man? 
No, um, so I wanted to share what, what I wrote um, on this scene. The words of Anatia, daughter of Avi Gile, one of the handmaids at the temple of Anatote. And the moment I saw you, I knew that I had been destined for you when my soul was yet on high. Before I was a swell in my mother's belly, I was consecrated to be the one to love you as a desert flower loves a drop of dew. I saw you surrounded with God and fell on my face and praised God and blessed you. And I knew that surely I would die should I lift my eyes and see the Holy One face to face. But I heard your brave little voice ring out as a clear glass bell. Ah, Lord God, I don't know how to speak. I lifted my eyes. I could not help myself. Your voice stirred me so. I looked up and saw you standing at God's very core, and yet you were not consumed. No, you radiated like a beacon in a pure star dewy mist, your skin translucent, a veil of sunlight over a sky blue soul, your eyes two black moons sailing through your open face, your skin gleaming like polished marble floors. Your ears were small as a newborn's open palms, snatching at God's words which filled the air like thin bubbles. You dazzled me. I opened my mouth to cry out to you, and the God that surrounded you streamed into my throat, swelling my soul. I thought I might die, but I lost my voice instead of my life. So I imagined in this scene, I imagined that when God put out a hand to touch Jeremiah, that God also put out a finger to touch this girl, Anatia, and that she never speaks again, that she goes mute and he is filled with words, but that they're caught in this, this um, prophecy somehow together. And all of the things that happen in Jeremiah's story are things that are literal in Anatia's story. So if Jeremiah, if you see, look in the rest of this chapter, it says, um, the word of the Lord came to me, what do you see? I replied, a branch on an, al on an almond tree. And then it also says, that uh, I see a steaming pot at the top of the next column, tipped away from the north. And these are all symbols, symbols of Israel's future. The steaming pot from the north are the nations that will come down and attack Israel. But from the perspective of the girl that I created, Anatia, the almond br branch is the branch that she uses. She puts the almond, she puts the flowers in her hair to beautify herself. She uses the almond branch to scratch his name in her thigh. The steaming pot is the pot that she's cooking to bring him cakes so that her, her fingers might somehow be able to touch him. Everything that is metaphorical to him is literal to her. So I was really in, in love with him. <laughs> in many ways, I wanted to get under his skin the way he was under my skin. And it's an interesting thing, it, that's not just me and my own madness, although there's plenty of that. <laughs> but in Judaism, the way that we wrestle and engage with text is physical in many ways. I remember when I was in rabbinical school and we had our student-led services and somebody gave their sermon while the Torah was out without a cover on it. So they had forgotten to dress the Torah and the Torah was out on the podium and the rabbi, the rabbinical student gave a sermon. And the professor afterward just became furious. He started yelling at our class. He said, how can you speak when your mother is lying naked on the table? Right? So that idea where you see text as physical, Torah itself is often compared to a girl in a tower with whom you're madly in love. In the Zohar, there's a beautiful passage, and you wander outside of her palace because you want so much to see her, to catch a glimpse of her, and you can't, for some reason, she can't come out of the palace. Her mysteries are locked up behind brambles and fences, but every now and then she peeks through the curtain, you see her, and you're filled with love, a physical love. It's a glimpse into a keyhole of, of a gleaming room, and you're satisfied for just that moment, and then you want more. So there's an obsession with text. So that's what I was caught up with, with Jeremiah. So if we go to chapter 3, would someone in a loud voice read the, the little excerpt there from chapter 3? Or better me to do it? Okay, all right. <laughs> I'll just do a different voice. Okay. <laughs> The word of the Lord came to me as follows. If a man divorces his wife and she leaves him and marries another man, can he ever go back to her? Would not such a land be defiled? 
There's a lot of that language in Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is also said to have written the book of Lamentations. And if you read the book of Jeremiah and the book of Lamentations, you do see a lot of similar structure in their poetic forms. And you also see a lot of metaphor about adultery and about the wayward wife and about um, a, a woman sinning and playing the harlot. In fact, if you go to the excerpt that I have from um, chapter 16 on page 3. It says, The word of the Lord came to me, You are not to marry, not to have sons and daughters in this place. So God is saying to Jeremiah, You can't, don't have any children here. For thus said the Lord concerning any sons and daughters born in this place, and concerning the mothers who bear them and the fathers who beget them, they shall die gruesome deaths. They shall not be lamented or buried. They shall be like dung on the surface of the ground. They shall be consumed by the sword and by famine, and their corpses shall be food for the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth. And Jeremiah goes on like that for many, many chapters. It's no question why he's so miserable, right? Um, where everyone he looks at, everything he loves, people are you know, lost in frivolity, and he just sees corpses. Right? He's, he has this vision of what they're going to become, and it's so unsettling and so disturbing. So I wanted to respond to that from, from my story and imagine what Anatia would say. And so she says, If God said to you as he said to Hosea, take a wife of harlotry. Do you know this, the story of the book of Hosea? So the prophet Hosea is told to marry a prostitute, and then he has two children through her, and the children are named, not my people, and no mercy. Lo ruchami and uh, lo ami. Right. So Anatia says, if God were to say to you, Jeremiah, as he said to Hosea, take a wife of har harlotry, I would stand at the entrance to Enaim without my face covered with a veil. I would wait with my face shining and exposed. I would not ask, what will you pay for sleeping with me? I would accept no pledge, but give myself freely. I would walk through the town of Gibeah alone before dawn. I would skip through the squares of Sodom and Gomorrah. I would bathe naked on rooftops in the noonday sun in full view of the king's palace. I would lower crimson ladders from my window. I would make my name more known than Gomer or Rahab, if only to be your wife if only to bear you children of the living God. So I really liked him. <laughs> but I also really wanted to provide this, um, this vision of, of deep love, even in the midst of this incredibly dark and um, this, this dark story. This, this story of just of loss, of sadness. I always remember how um, people who volunteer to be, to give therapy, to offer counsel to people who have been through great egregious crimes, refugees who are coming from places where there are, um, you know, uh, atrocities. And often what the therapists say afterwards is that the people who are fleeing these places come to them with the same problems as everybody else. You know, I like a boy, he doesn't like me back. That there's this, this real life aspect that's happening. And I think that when I wrote this book and when I was studying Jeremiah, I was a rabbinical student, I was in my 20s, and I was really thinking about what does it mean to be a rabbi? Does it mean to be someone, you know, there are cultures in Christianity, in Catholicism, to become a holy person is to be someone who doesn't uh, have relationships, who is a non-sexual being, supposed to be. And um, what does it mean to be a holy person to accept this mantle of tradition in Judaism? Now, a rabbi is different than a prophet, obviously. Um, a rabbi is a teacher, but there's a prophetic history uh, Judaism has this incredible prophetic history. And so what is, so I was wrestling with that question, and I think that writing Anatia was in part my desire to be also a physical human, a, a person, to explore that part of me, and at the same time also accept the, the yoke of spirituality and of um, being a leader like that. 
So we'll just go through a few, a little more, and tell a little more of Jeremiah's, a little more of Jeremiah's stories. So in chapter 5, back on page 1, Jeremiah is told, Roam the streets of Jerusalem, search its squares, look about and take note. You will not find a man, there is none who acts justly, who seeks integrity, that I should pardon, that I should pardon her, her being Jerusalem. Even when they say, as the Lord lives, they are sure to be swearing falsely. O oh Lord, your eyes look for integrity. You have struck them, but they sense no pain. You have consumed them, but they would accept no discipline. Then I thought, these are just poor folk. They act foolishly, for they do not know the way of the Lord, the rules of their God. So I will go to the wealthy and speak with them. Surely they will know the ways of the Lord. There's this interesting thing about Jeremiah, which makes him different than, the, uh, than many of the other prophets. For one thing, it's the most autobiographical book of all the prophets. So you have more of his story and more of his inner life than any of the other prophets. And you also see him wrestling with God. So here where he says, these are only poor folk, you can feel his, um, his sympathy with them. You know, they don't know. I don't think they should be cursed because they just don't know. How could they be punished if they don't know? Um, so it goes, it goes on, um, why should I forgive you? Your children have forsaken me and sworn by no gods. They were well-fed, lusty stallions, each neighing at another's wife. Shall I not punish such deeds? Hear this, O foolish people, devoid of intelligence. They have eyes, but they cannot see. So God is uh, having Jeremiah walk around the squares looking for good people, and all he sees everywhere he goes are people, um, you know, straying off the path. So in my story, I imagined that Anatia was watching him roaming the squares, and that while she was watching him, she was attacked by one of these unrighteous people. And in being attacked, she becomes disillusioned with the prophet so you she says you are roaming the streets and she's attacked and then um, she says uh, I feel the need to explain to the person who's attacking her that that he's made a mistake that I'm everything good left in fair Zion everything beautiful hidden underneath and he doesn't realize he thinks I'm just another street rat he doesn't know that I'm the keeper of a love a love of a prophet this is a mistake I can forgive a mistake, but you, why should I forgive you? You have forsaken me, Jeremiah. How is it that you listen to God, the most secret, and cannot intuit my longing? How is it that your eyes are filled with the rot of this city and are blind to the blooming in my heart? How can you keep walking and searching, and how dare you take your infatuated God with you when I'm the one? I'm the one who needs him and needs you, stupid prophet, and needs help, and please rescue my integrity. Curse you, Jeremiah. You have betrayed me. And, and later I write, I know now the truth about Cain and Abel. I love Jeremiah the way Cain, the way Cain loved you. Cain loved you, and Abel kept seducing you with gifts and plenty, and I do love Jeremiah, and you, God, keep seducing him with exquisite words and daring missions, while all I have is this unruly vineyard teeming with weeds and foxes. Do you have to be so beautiful, you who bring the early and late rain, you who paint bows of color across the mist and beget dewdrops? Forgive my ugliness and my anger. I'm so tiresome and troublesome. So for the year that I wrote this, I was following Jeremiah through these squares and trying to, and wrestling with my own relationship with Jewish texts and what it means. Okay, so we're going to move on in Jeremiah's life a little bit. In chapter 7, well, let's skip that. <laughs> if we go to, let's go to chapter 12 on... Uh, well, oh, sorry, chapter 11. Let's go to chapter 11. Hear the terms of this covenant and recite them to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And say to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Cursed be the man who will not obey the terms of this covenant, which I enjoin upon them, 
upon, which I enjoin upon your fathers when I freed them from the land of Egypt, the iron crucible, saying, Obey me and observe them just as I commanded you, that you may be my people and I may be your God, in order to fulfill the oath which I swore to your fathers, to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, as is now the case. And Jeremiah responds, Amen. Now, what's interesting about that amen is in verse 3 it had said, curse be the man who will not obey. And those curses are really, they're, they're described in detail, like a little bit of what I read before about um, children, not, there not being enough graves for the heaps of rotting bodies, horrible descriptions of these curses. And you think, is any crime worth the kind of curses? What is being asked here? Follow the covenant, observe Shabbat? A few people didn't observe Shabbat, and, and this is what happens. You know, it's similar to what we say when we wrestle with the theology that came out of the Holocaust. You know, what possible crime could have been committed that would merit this kind of torture? And you see that here in Jeremiah as well. And so I've always read this simple amen as a tired, defeated not a true amen, not amen, yes, curse the people, but rather an amen of somebody who is, um, is so sad and, and suffering for the people. I don't know if you feel that sometimes in services, <laughs> where, you, you know, there's a sense sometimes of being so, of feeling so small. It's one of it's one of the things, you know, Rabbi Feinstein said that the purpose of this series is really to talk about what the history of Judaism and how the history of Jewish thought is really forged in the prophets. It's really where it begins. And that concept of being God wrestlers is serious business, right? And, and it means that sometimes we're so tired and so angry. And I've talked about this before how my own theology, I've always believed in God. I've never doubted God's existence. I've always felt, felt God's presence. But I've also, most of my life, not been happy with God. So it's not, you know, that feeling of embrace. It's rather that, how can this happen? What do you want from me? You're eventually going to kill me too, right? You know, it's, it's angry. It's, uh, you know, rage, rage against the, the night. That's, that's how my relationship with God is. But it's a very real relationship. It's one that's not afraid. In fact, I, I um, keep kosher in that I don't mix milk and meat. The only time that I had a cheeseburger, well, when I was a kid, my parents didn't keep kosher, so I, the only time I had a cheeseburger was in the darkest moment in my life. It was such a dark place, and I went to a diner. You'd think it'd be the opposite. Some people get more religious when they're in a dark place. I went to a diner, and I was by myself, and I ordered a cheeseburger, and I took a bite, and it was like I was sitting with God. And I was like, yeah, yeah, after everything I do, I became a rabbi, you know, I'm leading this flock to you. All I talk about is you. All I think about is you. I'm trying to help partner with you and fix this world. Take that, um, you know. <laughs> and that's relationship. That's, that's what lovers do, Right? You fight and you wrestle and you come back together and you're grateful and you cry and you tremble. And that's part of what I love about Jeremiah is that he, he does that. And I, I feel all of that in this very small amen, this kind of defeated. Sometimes you just feel defeated. Okay. Okay. You know, hurricane. What can you say? So in chapter 12 you can really see how confused Jeremiah is. And as we read it, I want you to think about how we've inherited this kind of confusion about God. One of my favorite verses in all of Torah is um, where Moses said, God says to Moses, sorry, Moses says to the people, it's in Deuteronomy chapter 4, um, be, be very careful because you saw no shape at Sinai. To me, that's really the essence of Jewish theology. We saw no shape, which means that we always have to figure out what this is. Know before whom you stand. How do you do that? We saw no shape. And so all of our projections, all of our um, experiences, all of our anecdotal evidence of God is relevant because there's no, 
There's no shape. So in chapter 12, Jeremiah says, You'll win, God. You'll win, O Lord, if I make my claim against you. Yet I shall present charges against you. So it's pretty brave, right? I know you're going to win, but I'm still going to stand up to you. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are the workers of treachery at ease? Why do good things happen to bad people all the time? I'm asking you that. I'm taking you to trial and asking you that. Even though I know you're going to win this case because, you know, you planted them and they've taken root. You're allowing this to happen, right? They spread. They even bear fruit. You are present in their mouths, but far from their thoughts. Yet you, Lord, have noted and observed me. You've tested my heart and found it with you. Drive them out like sheep to the slaughter. Prepare them for the day of slaying. So what's, what is Jeremiah's tone when he says that? Is he, just, is he confused? You know, he at one point feels sorry for the people. You planted them. You, you did. You, I think it's in the book of Job where Job says, can the leopard change his spots? You know, why do you harass a driven leaf? You know, help us. You created us this way. You put the tree in the middle of the garden and then said, don't eat it. But you made it the most luscious looking tree possible. Why are temptations so strong? You plant and planted these lusts within us. So is Jeremiah saying drive them out like sheep to the slaughter because he's confused or is it ironic or is he frustrated? Yeah. Fine. Do it. Do it already. You're going to do it anyway. That was Jonah's belief, right? How long must the land languish and the grass of all the countryside dry up? Must beasts and birds perish because of the evil of its inhabitants? And I love, I love verse 5. If you race with the foot runners and they exhaust you, how then can you compete with the horses? And the rabbis say that that's God speaking back to Jeremiah. Okay, you, think, you think you got a big argument. You're just racing with foot runners and you're barely keeping up. So don't imagine that you can keep up with the horses. Chapter, uh, okay, so um, I want to just take a little foray into poetry. Any thoughts or questions that you want to share as you look at some Jeremiah texts? Next hour. Next hour. Okay, all right. <laughs> so in one of these texts, it said, it talks about the people circumcising their hearts. And it, there's a lot of talk about circumcision <laughs> in these texts. Um, and so I wanted to read Anatia's uh, response to that, if I could just find it. And um, OK, so let's, let's look at, while I'm looking for that, in chapter 13, we have God says to Jeremiah to buy a loincloth of linen and to wrap it around his loins and then afterwards to take it off and bury it and let it rot and be eaten by worms and then later to come back and dig it up. And it's symbolic of how intimate and close Israel was to God. So God is comparing Israel to God's own loincloth, right? and how far it's strayed and how um, dirty it's become. Now, for Anatia, none of that is metaphor. That's all, wow, Jeremiah's loincloth. <laughs> She's really um, amazed. That's the, first time that, that's the first time that she sees um, Jeremiah naked. The only time. <laughs> and so in my book, there's a description of, I don't know if you read that part, but because <laughs> I think you, you read Drawing in the Dust, but um, there is a description hidden in there of uh, Anatia having her, her eyes open. So, um, but this is, um, this is something uh, I don't usually read out loud. But remember, I was in my 20s. <laughs> um, Boars snuff for truffles in the dust. Just, Boars snuff for truffles in the dust, children scuffle for coins in the sand, treasure hunters and grave robbers tunnel a labyrinth through Sheol. All eyes comb the footpath for a gem, a creeping herb, an antler for luck. 
Last night as I lay upon my mat, my soul sought to find the one I love. I walked through a damp garden and glisten caught my eye. A drop of star, a tiger's tooth. I crouched down to pick it up. In my hand, it was tiny and soft like a baby's earlobe, and I loved it like a baby. It was the foreskin of an eight-day-old prophet. I'd trade a truffle, a coin, a treasure to any finder's keeper for that piece of you their flintstones sheared away. This is the key to your covenant with heaven. And so I don't know if anybody read the book Foreskin's Lament. I wrote this before <laughs> that book came out. Have you read that? No. It's a really funny book, but, uh, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> but I've always loved the title. But um, that, that longing for not just the piece, that piece of the prophet, but symbolically the, the longing to be whole again, that somehow to be in partnership with God is to make a sacrifice, that we all have to, we lose a piece of ourselves in this sacrifice in joining with, with God. Okay, so um, we'll just read a little bit, a little bit more. On the bottom of the page in chapter 19, then you shall smash the jug in the sight. So Jeremiah is told to buy a jug. Then you shall smash the jug in the sight of the men who go with you and say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, so I will smash this people and this city as one smashes a potter's vessel. So in the book of Anatia, those broken pieces are pieces that she collects and she prays that in a future time, in a messianic age, that while God is busy reviving the souls of all the dead, that God also should mend this little jug because it is most, most precious. So back to Jeremiah's confusion and depression. In chapter 20, it really comes to a head where it says, You enticed me, O Lord, and I was enticed. You overpowered me, and you prevailed. I've become a constant laughing stock. Everyone jeers at me. I thought, I will not mention him. No more will I speak his name. That's really, that's something we don't expect to hear from a prophet. A prophet saying, I'm not going to talk about God anymore. I refuse to speak God's name. That's how angry he is with God, right? But his word was like a raging fire in my heart. He's possessed with God. Shut up in my bones. I couldn't hold it in. I was helpless. I heard the whispers of the crowd, terror all around. Inform, let us inform against him. So what was happening in Jeremiah's life is that Jeremiah is actually preaching for the people to allow themselves to be exiled, to uh, surrender. And because he was preaching surrender, he was seen as a, as a traitor. All my supposed friends are waiting for me to stumble. Perhaps he can be entrapped and we can prevail against him and take our vengeance on him. Cursed be the day that I was born. Let not the day be blessed when my mother bore me. A curse be the man who brought my father the news and said, A boy is born to you and gave him such joy. Let that man become like the cities which the Lord overthrew without relenting. Let him hear shrieks in the morning and battle shouts at noontide. Because he did not kill me before birth so that my mother might be my grave and her womb big with me for all time. Why did I ever issue from the womb to see misery and woe, to spend all my days in shame? Powerful, right? Sad. Maybe some of you want to hug him also now. <laughs> um, but, but what is it like to be that person? What is it like to be the one who walks through the world and sees? Uh, you know, when I think of who do I know who's like this, the first people who come to mind are environmentalists. Right. I don't know if who comes to I don't know who comes to your mind when you think of who's a modern Jeremiah, but I know that some of my friends who are who are real activists in environmentalism, they just walk around everything they see, everything, everything, all the material, everything we use, every light bulb, every water bottle, everything spells doom to them, and it's a very depressing, a very depressing way to live. And, and yet we, we need those prophets, right? Somebody needs to be those, someone needs to be those people. Um, so I, on this chapter I wrote, 
If I could dig up the body of Elisha, I would touch you with one of his bones like a wand and bring you back to life, to a life I know must exist, where tides are even-tempered and sunlight citrus sweet. Let me rinse your worn-out soul in the warm fountains of the Galil that bubble up from hidden springs so that you emerge, your lips blessing the day you were born, praising the man who brought your father the news that a boy was born to him and gave him such joy. If God only would do for you what he did for the wicked Balaam and turn your curses into blessings and turn your multitude of enemies into pinpoints of light that guide ships and nations and let us spend all our days in love. I actually wrote about imagining uh, let Jeremiah be the first complete and perfect man with all of his ribs in place and let me be the one to complete him. Put me back into his chest. In chapter, in the next chapter, oh, so at the, in chapter 27, Jeremiah is told to make a yoke and to wear a yoke around his neck and to carry around this yoke. Uh, so representing how, representing how enslaved Israel has become to its, its hedonistic ways. And in chapter 29, it says, this is the text of a letter which the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the priests, the prophets, the rest of the elders. So Jeremiah writes a letter and sends them to the people who have been exiled. And the letter is really interesting. At first, it's interesting that we have a record here of the letter that he wrote to people, you know, in the 600s BCE when they were exiled from their land. What would, what would you tell them? What's his advice to the people? And his advice is not rise up. His advice is not organize and overthrow. It's not even come back to the land. Fight your way, hide. His advice is totally different. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to the whole community which I exiled from Jerusalem, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters. Live generations in this land. Multiply there. Do not decrease. And seek the welfare of the city to which I have exiled you and pray to the Lord in its behalf. For in its prosperity you shall prosper. That's really interesting. How, how is that letter still resonant with us today? Yeah, and, and Poland and anywhere, you know, we, we've lived, we lived places until we were told that we didn't belong. We never felt that we didn't belong. We had a dream of Zion, right? But it was, it was it, it, until uh, Herzl, it was a dream. It was part of our, our, there's a definition of nostalgia, which is the longing for a home that never actually existed, Right? And we were committed. We fought in the armies of the countries in which we lived. We prayed for the, we have in most of our services, we have a prayer for America, right? And so here we have at this time when people are being taken away in chains and have every reason to hate their captives, we have Jeremiah the prophet who was hated by the people and whose message was mocked, but his message rings true throughout the ages. Pray for the prosperity of the city in which you're in. And maybe that's the Jewish mission. The Jewish mission, the idea of being a lighthouse to the nation, a light to the nation, sorry, to be a light to the nation, I've always thought of as a lighthouse, because the purpose of the lighthouse is the ships. The light isn't there to serve itself. The lighthouse is there to guide the ships. Once the ships are all safe at shore, you don't need the lighthouse anymore. And that's Judaism. Judaism is a, is a progressive religion, meaning that when we get there, we don't need Judaism anymore. So other religions imagine a messianic age where everybody is the same, right? I remember talking to someone who was Mormon um, who said, it doesn't matter if you convert to Mormonism or not because once you die, you're Mormon. So it doesn't really matter what you think, right? Everybody's Mormon in the next world, right? For Jews, we believe that in the messianic age, there's no need for Judaism. All our holidays go away except for Hanukkah and Purim, which are the most human-based holidays. They're not really God-centered. You know, there's no need to create separate holy times because everything is holy. And not only that, we get to feast on Leviathan. That's not a kosher animal, 
You know, so Judaism goes away because the whole purpose of Judaism is to pray for the prosperity of our cities that are broken and filled with enslavers, that are corrupt. We're there to do that. I think it was Gandhi who said that you can, the litmus test of a moral nation is how it treats its animals. I think it's also how it treats its Jews. <laughs> We're there as the litmus test for, for society. And it's, and it's not, Jeremiah is not saying, go back and cloister yourself and separate yourself. He's saying, stay there, plant gardens, multiply. Do not, what, whatever you do, don't decrease. Keep giving. I always find it interesting that he says multiply, but doesn't say be fruitful. You know, so the, the commandment in Genesis is be fruitful and multiply, right, to all the creatures. And I feel that Jeremiah is, is so brilliant that he knew that, that he wasn't, he was telling them, you don't have to be fruitful, you can be sad. You know, you don't have to be generative and productive all the time. You can be sad, but keep multiplying. In fact, I don't know if you know the story, the, the Midrash about the haroset and why we eat haroset, which is that when the Israelite men would come home from working in the, in, you know, enslaved, working on the cities for Pharaoh and the taskmasters, beaten and bruised and exhausted, they didn't feel like making love with their spouses. They didn't want to bring children, not only, they didn't feel the desire because they didn't feel human, and they didn't want to bring children into the world that was so awful. And so the women brought their husbands into the apple orchards and with mirrors would remind them of their, their beauty. They'd hold up the mirrors and they'd say, do you think I'm pretty? Do you think you're pretty? It actually talks about this in the Talmud. Am I pretty? Are you pretty? Am I pretty? Are you pretty? Until the men kind of are aroused. And it's in the apple orchards that they increase the people. That they, and, and that Midrash comes in reference to in Exodus when God tells Moses to build the, um, this, the basin outside of the tabernacle out of women's mirrors. So the question the rabbis are asking is, what's holy about mirrors? Well, mirrors remind you that you're human and show your beauty and help you not decrease. Okay, so I'm just going to close it. Good. Okay, so, thank you. I'm just looking for the time. <laughs> so just to the, the last things, I, I'll just go to that last chapter. The highlighted parts are just because for some reason my computer is haunted and it would not let me unhighlight. It's not because. <laughs> I just wanted to share one other person uh, who loved Jeremiah as much as I do, I think. Um, in chapter 38, the king instructed Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian. Now, um, Jeremiah is in a pit right now in jail. And the king tells him, take with you 32 men from here and pull the prophet Jeremiah up from the pit before he dies. So Eben Melech took the men with him and went to the king's palace to the, the place below the treasury. They got worn cloths and rags. And Eben Melech, the Ethiopian, called to Jeremiah and said, put the, worn, put the worn rags and cloths and rags under your armpits inside the ropes. And I just love that little detail that this um, servant of the king took that moment and that it's actually recorded in a holy text that he cared about the chafing of Jeremiah's arms as he was pulled out of the pit. That just that tiny little detail of love and he makes it eternally into our canonized text for that little tiny display of humanity and caring. So I look forward to hearing questions and to talking with, with you and with Rabbi about about this book. Thank you. We have lots of questions about who Jeremiah is and, and the, the meaning of Jeremiah's text. Uh, but as Rabbi uh, Zoe just told us, um, when we die, we're all going to be Mormon. So I'd suggest getting as much coffee as you can now. Okay? Because that's your last coffee. I mean, so get as much coffee as you can. And we'll be back in about five and a half, ten minutes to continue our conversation about the prophet Jeremiah. Come on in. Come on in. Everybody well? Got lots of questions for Rabbi Zoe. Excellent. Come on in. Come on in. Good. Welcome back. Round two. Everybody, how are the brownies? Are they good? Are they gone? No brownies tonight? <laughs> have to come back for brownies. Okay. Shh. What's that? No, no, I, I can't. I just ask if you have them. You have them. 
Jeff, you need them more than I do. It's good. It's, it's, these are super brownies. Yeah, I know. It's good. I have many questions. I, I want to ask you some questions about your own work. But before we get to that, I want to ask you some questions about Jeremiah. Okay? Yeah. Um, so let, let's begin with something that's a little bit of each. Um, Anatia is, I, I take it, somewhat autobiographical as well, right? I mean, but so, but in the my question mind, is, yeah. but so autobiographically, why did Zoe fall in love with Jeremiah? What what is it about Jeremiah, of all the characters, all the there's some, you know, of all the compelling characters in the in the in the biblical canon, you fell in love with Jeremiah? Why him? What was it about him? I, uh, part of it is, is part of it is the the poetry of Jeremiah and the way that he expresses himself, and there's something you know, um, in many ways Jeremiah is our Jesus. You know, Jeremiah is the suffering servant. Jeremiah takes the sins of uh, all of our sins upon himself. He's thrown in jail. He's a, he's attacked. He's ridiculed. He. Um, and, and he carries this on for 40 years. You know, Jesus' ministry was three years. Jeremiah's 40 years of, of devoting his life to trying to rescue this people. And there's something about the courage of... Um, the, the cur One of the things I didn't mention that he does, which is such an incredible act, is right before the exile, he buys land in Anatote. So he actually purchases land. And in the book of Jeremiah, there's a record of the deed of his purchase of, the, of this land. And so what an act of hope. In the midst of all of the doom, I see this incredibly hopeful, beautiful soul, this optimist that believes that one day he'll return. And I think that drew me. What drives him? What, what drives him for 40 years to preach against the, the corruption of this people, to try to save the people. If I remember correctly, even in the very beginning of the book, God says to him, this is a futile mission. You're, I'm going to destroy them. You're not going to talk me out of it, and you're not going to talk them into doing tshuva. So for 40 years, he's pursuing this rather futile dream. What do you see as driving him forward? I think that a lot of the times he he's almost at the end. I mean, I think that he's the most depressed and suicidal of the, patient, of, the, of the prophets in many ways, but he does, he does find a way to continue forward. I think that all of the doom that he preaches, it's not that he, he doesn't want to preach it, and so I think what he does is he finds little opportunities to either question God or introduce a question or to demonstrate hope, whether it's through the letter, you know, have your children, have children in this land, pray for the prosperity, or purchasing land. Um, he seems to, he he seems to be a hopeful person who's caught in this this whirl of of lightning, you know, but still manages some time to to show his own light. So I, I want to understand the phenomenology of, of the phenomenon of prophecy. You, you've lived with him for a long time. And I really want to understand this because I, I, I'm going to take, I got to confess to you, I love the prophetic literature. I don't understand prophecy. Basically, like you, you read us this, this piece on, on just the very beginning in chapter one, famous, famous chapter, of course. He comes to him and says, um, I, 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 I consecrate you, you know, I, I recruit you. Um, and he says, I'm just a kid. And he says, don't say I'm a kid. I'll be with you. And then he has this phrase, which you, you read for us. Uh, verse 9. The Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said, herewith I put my words into your mouth. What does that mean? Right? Let me put it to you bluntly, because everything we do in this shul is blunt. Um, <laughs> if a guy stands on the corner, well, let's take your neighborhood. The guy stands on the corner of, uh, of, uh, of Beverwill and Pico and says, God spoke to me, and this is what he said. We have a solution. We give the guy a shot of Haldol. We, we put him in a psychiatric ward for 72 hours. We keep an eye on him. And if he doesn't hurt anybody, we let him out. We call those people psychotics. Here's a guy who says the same thing, only it was 3,200 years ago, and we call the guy a prophet. What is he to you? When you imagine him speaking the word of God, what does that mean to you? 
Are these his words? Are these God's words? Is he a ventriloquist dummy sitting on God's lap? Is he a megaphone? Does he make these words up himself? How do you interpret the phenomenon of prophecy? You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a good question, and I, I, don't, I don't have an immediate answer, so I'm making up this answer as like, well, we're, so, we're to, just to, to, to be blunt. Stuff. So I'm, I'm thinking about how when, um, when, I'm thinking about how when somebody flips a house, right? So they, they build, they tear down a house, they build a new house, and then there's always the stager who comes in and sets up, you know, and it's supposed to look kind of blank enough. All the tones are all neutral whites and light gray so that you can imagine yourself. It's like a mannequin wearing, you know, the mannequin can't have too much personality because you're supposed to be able to imagine yourself in those clothing. It's the same with models. And I think of that when I think of a prophet in that the prophet is a perfect vessel for God to fill. But the vessel also has its own, you know, suppressed emotions, opinions, feelings, you know, Jeremiah is saying things to the people, but at the same time questioning the message, questioning God. So I do, I think of the prophet as one who channels, who channels God's word, um, and, you know, is maybe articulate enough, poetic enough, uh, a good enough orator, strong enough to, to handle the, the electricity that is put inside of him. Um, but is, is possessed. I, is possessed. Possessed. Yeah. It's an interesting word. So tell me about the God of Jeremiah. Who is this God that Jeremiah is, is possessed by, that Jeremiah is wrestling with? And, and, and how does this God relate to the world? So this is where I fear becoming unpopular, but um, I... I wrestle with God a lot, and perhaps that's maybe that's the truest, truer answer as to my connection with Jeremiah. Is um, I I wrestle with the I wrestle with um, God's goodness in terms of our definition of goodness. So um, I believe in what um, Rabbi Irv Green, what Rabbi Yitz Greenberg said that. There's no theology that makes sense if you can't preach it in front of a child who's been set on fire. Because that's a truth, right? So if your theology doesn't match that, if you can't even, if you can't say it at that moment, right, what do we do? You want to put out the fire. What if you can't put out the fire? There are children burning right now. You know, how do we, how does our, how does our theology make sense in that? I question that. Right? I wrestle with that. I get angry at that. I'm furious at that. Um, but I don't, I don't think that God doesn't exist, but I question what, what this is all about. Um, I don't trust that it's all going to be okay. That's my... Yeah, but at the same time, I'm really conflicted because I, I believe and I'm grateful and thank you for this every day, for for love, for breath, for heartbeat, for children, for thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, but I, I'm, I, guess, I guess I'm just one of those people I can never forget about the, the burning children. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, but is that God? Yeah. I mean, do, you, do you attribute that to God's judgment? As a monotheist, I can't separate it from God. Okay. Because I, I don't believe in a devil or Satan. I believe that it's all... God, what, what I've come to believe is that, um, that God, when God created the physical world, God also created a kind of impotence in God's self, that the physical world has its own properties, and those properties of decay and friction happen, um, and God can't control them. God can weep with us, and that sometimes that's the best that we can experience. Um, I believe that when we suffer, we're not alone. But I also um, rail against how imperfect this creation is. Sometimes I think that we're actually just caught in the twilight of the sixth day, and we're just not done. And we're kind of in the same place that Jeremiah is. Everything's falling apart. And, you know, plant, 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 
multiply, don't decrease, because one day, Yom Shikolo Shabbat, one day Shabbat will come. Well, see, so I wanted to make a distinction. I, I appreciate your theology, okay? Yeah. I mean, we could argue your theology. Yeah. We'll do that another time. Um, Jeremiah, however, I think is pretty much convinced, and God tells him, that Nebuchadnezzar is coming to destroy Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar is the tool of God's judgment, the stick of God's wrath, I think he calls him. So there's no question in Jeremiah's mind that the catastrophe that's coming is the will of God. It's the judgment of God yeah. punishing this evil city for its lapses of covenantal loyalty. So the, the question is, is, is that, that's a very punitive... I mean, he, he, Jeremiah could take your theology and say, listen, Nebuchadnezzar's coming. It's just an accident of geopolitics. There's nothing to do with God's judgment. Right. We happen to sit on the highway between Mesopotamia and Egypt. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar needs to control it. He needs to destroy us in the process, suck right. it up, and live with it. But he doesn't say that. He interprets the geopolitics of his day as the direct will of his God. The it's real Jewish neurosis, right? <laughs> this pagan empire is coming to destroy us, and it's our own damn fault. Right. That's a little neurotic, Nebuch. No, you know. It, it, well, yes. It, it. What's interesting about it is, as modern thinkers, we we don't we we're not attracted to the idea that it's our fault. We don't like to blame the victim. We don't like to say, um, you know, that that anybody you know deserved pain. Um, however, what's interesting is when you look at the Hasidic writings that survived, uh, you know, pogroms or the Holocaust. Um, you see a lot of that talk. You see, you hardly see the word Nazi. You hardly see the name Hitler. You see talk about ourselves and our God. And in a way, even though as moderns we don't like that, um, if you look at it from a different, if you just pivot a little bit, there's something very empowering about it. It's not about victim, victimhood. What it's saying is that all those bad people who are hurting us, they don't matter. They're nothing. The only thing that matters is my relationship with God. And so I'm not going to give that any air. It's just about me and God. And maybe Jeremiah sets the stage for that kind of, that kind of thinking. But you're right. The God of Jeremiah is incredibly punishing. When you read Lamentations also, Jerusalem is, in, is compared to a harlot, to, to um, you know, promiscuous and, and committing adultery with anyone and whoring with the gods and... Um, her skirts are filthy, and she should be punished in every way. I mean, God, God sounds like a like an abusive husband. Yeah. 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 And we sound like the abused wife. Right. You know, if only I kept the house a little cleaner and kept the kids a little quieter and cooked them right. a nice dinner. Right. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Please me. come back. Yeah. Yeah. Just do do what I say. Come back. Do what I say, and everything will be fine, and I'll forgive you. You. Right you know, harlot. Yeah. Right. It's, it's yeah. <laughs> That's my problem with Jeremiah. I'm, That's, I'm, well, I, have, I can appreciate his ethics and I can appreciate his, his, his vision, but I have a really hard time with his theology. So the only thing that I would say, yes, I have a hard time with his theology too, except that the, the one who I wrestle with over that is God, because I actually... I, I think that our world is is still as broken as it was then. You know, we every year we say, um, you know, we talk about freedom and we were slaves in the land of Egypt and there are more slaves today than have ever been in the world. They're just more hidden. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, why is our theology more, you know, why is our theology fluffier and sweeter and more love-based when actually... There's so much horror around. I want to hold God accountable for those things. And in these stories, it, these stories in a way allow us to be angry at God. And being angry at God in Judaism is a form of prayer. It's a form of engagement. You know, there's the famous poem that says where God, that says, you know, revile me, hate me, just don't look at the stars and yawn. Right? Because engage in the world with me. However, people are afraid to do that, right? Because you don't want to piss God off. <laughs> so you don't want to get mad at God. But um, So I do that for everybody. Mm -hmm. 
You're I take that on myself. The suffering servant of uh, Temple <laughs> Isaiah. Okay. We, we, we'll talk to theology another time because I think we oh, okay. need to come back to this because I have, uh, if I say I have rather violent disagreements with what you just said, that would oh. be an understatement, but wow. no, not for now, not for now. <laughs> I want to go back to Jeremiah. Um, I want to go back to, and I, uh, let's take a moment before we finish with Jeremiah and talk about Jeremiah in the, in, in the context of the prophets. What makes him unique among the prophets? Or, or, or rather, what, what, in what ways is he like the other prophets, and in what ways is he different than, say, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Jonah, the people that we've, right. that we, that we've referenced? Um, well, he's like the other prophets in that none of the prophets want to be prophets. They all run away from, from prophecy. Um, none of them, they, even Moses says, please, I, I'm heavy of tongue, don't pick me, I can't do it. So he's similar in those ways. I think the sheer length of time that he prophesied um, is unique um, uh, you know, with the prophets. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of the longest books of the, I think is Ezekiel and Jeremiah are the longest, and Isaiah are, are long. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you think? What, what do I think? You're, of, I think you're more of the historian no, in terms no, no, of what's no, like. I'm, just, I'm really yeah. interested. <laughs> they, they, they don't want to be prophets, okay? Um, and they show up, and, and they're, they're reflecting a, a, a theology of covenant. And covenant means you're a chosen people, you receive God's blessings and God's protection, and you receive the land you live on. And in return, you have to live up to a certain standard of both social and, and, and religious ethics. And the prophet is the one who says, you're blowing it. You, you, haven't kept to the, you haven't kept the social ethics, and you haven't kept the religious ethics. And, and all of them basically reflect that same message. Now, what's really interesting about the prophets is, of all the prophets in the Bible, only one was ever successful. You know what it was? Jonah. And he's the only one who preached to non-Jews. And, the, 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 and the, the book of Jonah is, I think there's a, there's a quality, maybe because it's my own weird personality that I find humor in all things, but there's a really funny statement in the book of Jonah, right? The prophet, there's, there's what? How many chapters? 39 chapters of Jeremiah. And the 52, I think 52. 52, 52 chapters 52. of Jeremiah. Yeah. There's 66 chapters of Isaiah. There's something, 40-something chapters of Ezekiel, right? Jonah, and, and, and they, they prophesied all this stuff to the people of Israel, and not one Jew did tshuva. <laughs> not one. I mean, that wonderful statement that you read, where God says, go, walk the streets of Jerusalem. You find me one righteous guy, I'll save the city. And Jonah goes looking, and he couldn't find even one, right? He looked in every 7-Eleven, you know, and every, every club and every rest, every IHOP, you know, every op open all-night restaurant looking for one righteous person. Couldn't find one. Couldn't find one. Jonah goes to Nineveh. What is Nineveh? It's the capital of Assyria. They're the people who destroyed our, the northern kingdom. It's the heart of darkness, the darkest, That's why he didn't want to go. meanest place in the world, and he speaks four words, right? Right, a four or five. Od arba'im yom, ninva ne'apechet, five words, right? Forty days, ninva's toast. Well, that's kind of like when I... I, I and the whole city of Ninva does tshuva. This is such a wonderful reflection on Jews, right? I remember looking up once the, the last sermon that the the head of Jonestown gave right before oh, everybody God. killed themselves. Yeah. And I, I That's was like, weird. <laughs> I was like, that, like, that must have been a compelling sermon. <laughs> you know? If you I told them like, to keep kosher, yeah, just I like, yeah. I want to see, like, what was his technique, you know? Right. And uh, it wasn't. Really? Yeah. No, it was like Jonah. It was like, let's do this thing. <laughs> you know? Like, <laughs> that's, uh, so I think that what's happening here is it's, <laughs> this, is a, this is covenantal castigation. And I think the other theme that I find in, in, in Jeremiah, and tell me if I'm wrong, Jeremiah, see, and maybe this is my secularizing of Jeremiah, which is how you and I read it a little bit differently, is that Jeremiah sees that the obstacle to covenantal loyalty is sovereignty. People are worshiping the state. Mm. They're worshiping the army. They're worshiping the king. They have this idea that we're a country and that's the most important part of our identity. And what he tries to tell them is, we're no longer a country. Nebuchadnezzar's coming, and when he destroys us, he's going to destroy the country. So we can survive as long as we redefine our identity, not as citizens of a state, but as members of a covenantal religious community.
that has no political status whatsoever. In other words, we'll float through history, like that feather in Forrest Gump, you know? We'll float <laughs> through history. We won't have a country. We won't have a government. We won't have a king. We want no material power in the world. We just, we want to just leave us alone and let us live a life of Torah. So Jeremiah says to the people, he wears that yoke and he says, give in, give up. You don't have to win this war. If you lose the war, you'll win because you'll preserve the integrity of the people. And in fact, Talmud, Babylonian Talmud, it comes from, they set up yeshivas. Right. They do. Well, the same thing happens again with Yochanan ben Zakkai. He goes to the Romans, and the Romans say, what do you want? And he doesn't ask for the city or the temple. He asks for Yavna and the scholars. So I think that part of this is a, a reinterpretation of the basic structure of Jewish life. And, and it's impossible to hear that. Because then, like now, we are really taken with the idea of sovereignty. Like, especially men. You know, men have this thing about power, you know? And, 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 and you're taken with this, this pride of, of sovereignty. And men, men have a thing about authority. Women have power. <laughs> it's a difference. I didn't say they have power. <laughs> they have this obsession with power. <laughs> they have an obsession with power. So, they, so, so he preaches surrender. And right. pre preaching surrender is, is an amazingly, I mean, because what he's really preaching is a whole redefinition of who we are, right? Yeah, it's, it's, in, it's really, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, it's, um, there's so much courage in trying to remain the same, you know, to, to be true to your roots as opposed to, you know, it's, it's what happens in, in Deuteronomy when the people are saying, crying out for a king and Moses tells them, this is what's going to happen if you have a king. Right. You know, your, your sons are all going to become foot soldiers. Your, your daughters are going to be working. Your lands are going to be taxed. This is, you're going to lose everything to the king. And the people say that's what we want. That's what we want. Let, let me ask you one last question about your work, and then I, we'll get some questions from, the, from everybody else. So in your, in your piece, in your book, you wrote a counterpoint to the book of Jeremiah yeah. from Anatia. Right? So, and, and you did it so beautifully and poetically where you reflected back and forth on the, the themes of, of, of Jeremiah. Um, so, so two questions. One is like, so what was missing in Jeremiah that needed Anatia to articulate it? And, and do you think that the rest, of the, the rest of the biblical canon deserves the same treatment? Are you gonna write the book of Miriam for us one year <laughs> so we can hear the other side of Moses' story? Yeah. I think what is missing is um, the same, you know, when Abraham says, uh, will you save, the, will you destroy these cities because it, you know, if there are 10 innocent people. Um, I think what's missing is the other voice, which is, would you destroy this city if there's even one sinner who might repent? Which is mercy. Mm -hmm. And, and you can find, you can, you can play connect the dots and find little, you know, little keyholes of light where there's mercy. And you could connect those and create a constellation. But, but there really is very little, there's, there's destruction, you know, there's um, collective punishment. <coughs> and I think what's missing is that... Um, is is that that touch of forgiveness of um, of love of maybe maybe even feminine um, subjectivity, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to lawful objectivity. So, is there a book of Miriam coming one day? <laughs> I you know I I don't know I just I just wrote I just wrote a children's book called The Goblins of Nottingham. So maybe. <laughs> really. <laughs> What's it, about? What's it about? It's about the history of why challah is braided, um, oh, okay. and it there has to go. do with goblins. Um, goblins. But uh, but maybe the next piece will be no, because I think that what you did is for it's it's take some water. You have hot water, yeah. cold water, Thank you. fresh water. Um, I, I think that the, the idea that that the the Bible has has po poetry, and the Bible has profound vision, but it's missing voices because it was edited in a certain way and that your job as a Midrash scholar is to add that missing voice. So here you've given us the feminine voice that's missing from Jeremiah's tale, 
Well, the prophets, the prophets are almost never really talking directly to women. You know, so the prophets are saying, um, your, this will happen to your wives. This will happen to your daughters. And either the city itself is compared to a woman, Israel itself is compared to God's, God's wife, the, the, the love of my youth, and so there's feminine there. But, not, but the, the story doesn't talk directly to women. The you is always men. And so I think that's where I felt permission to step into the story because I wasn't the audience. So I felt like maybe I was inside the story in a different way. Mm. Just like in the book of Proverbs, where the book of Proverbs begins by describing wisdom as a woman and as God's consort. You know, wisdom has always been with me as my consort, God says. And so I felt that I could be inside the story somehow, where, you know, talking to a male audience, but experiencing it as a woman. So if you were going to, just, just for, for argument's sake for a yeah. moment, so if we're going to move from the prophets back to the Torah, right? so the, the character would be Miriam, because that, she's, the, she's Moses' opposite, right? So what would, what would it sound like to offer that kind of, that voice that's missing from the Torah's voice? Well, there's Miriam, but I would also, I think the first person I would go to would probably be Sarah, because Sarah, you know, there's this really interesting moment when um, Sarah hears that she's going to have a baby at 90, and she laughs. And God says to Abraham, did your wife just laugh at me? And she says, I didn't laugh. And God said, oh, yeah, you did. And nothing happens. She's not, she's not killed. She's not, you know, but it's recorded that they had this weird little intimacy, her and God. Yeah, yeah, you laughed. Almost like she has kind of a divine status, and they're playful together. And this idea that when they cross into Egypt, Abraham and Sarah, her beauty is such that uh, Abraham's afraid that he's going to be killed because she's so exquisite. There's actually a midrash that Abraham was so modest he never looked at Sarah. He always kept his head down, and he only realized how beautiful she was when they were traveling, and they stepped over a puddle, and he saw her reflection. He was like, oh, my God, we got to cover you up, you know, or pretend I'm your brother or something because you're, you're so beautiful. And so she has this kind of, she has a, like a goddess-like status, um, and even when she does something, when she's really harsh in sending away Hagar and Ishmael, um, when Abraham questions that, God says, do as your wife says. You know, God almost, you know, obeys what Sarah's desire is, even though it's sending away one of Abraham's children. And Hagar herself is Egyptian. And you could trace, you know, the, the Jewish woman exiling the Egyptian, um, first beating her and then exiling her to then what happens centuries later with Egyptians then enslaving um, the Jews. So, so if you look at the whole story through the eyes of Sarah, as opposed to an Abrahamic tradition, we somehow think of ourselves as a Sarahitic tradition. Um, you, you could elevate these little hints that we have and, and create a really interesting story. All right, so a preview of coming attraction. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, anyone have a question they'd like to ask? Um, just raise your hand, and Louise, who is our wonderful volunteer extraordinaire, will bring a microphone around. Please be reminded that we keep questions to one sentence with a question mark at the end, <laughs> so that Rabbi Zoe can answer for us, please. OK, so I, I can't do the setup then. How did you keep your sanity while you were writing uh, these two works, if you want one, one question. Because uh, the rabbi used the term possessed. And the reason I'm asking this is I'm trying to figure out a way to get in to this concept of prophecy and prophets. And I am having a hard time. I don't know if it's because I'm modern. OK, mm -hmm. please. Um, so how did I keep my sanity? Well, I, I'm okay with losing a little bit of sanity. You know, so, I, and I think that when, when you are an artist, and I grew up in an artist's home, you, you have to be courageous enough to allow a little bit of insanity to happen. You have to make sure you're safe to allow it in and that those around you are safe. Um, but, you know, I have a picture of myself writing from when I was in college, actually, and I was like on a, a writing binge. It had been maybe it had been over a week since I had showered, and it's my favorite picture of myself. I 
think I'm the most beautiful in that picture. I'm not. But my hair is in a baseball hat, and I have a kind of, I'm staring at the screen, and my fingers are tense, and I'm, I'm just, um, it, I'm alive, you know. And I think that sometimes, you know, I, I think of God sometimes as a downed power wire. You know, you can't touch it. It's that all over the Torah, it says, don't touch it. Don't look at me. Don't touch the mountain. Don't come near you know, I'm too powerful. You're, you, you can't handle it. Don't, even to Moses, don't, okay, you want to see me? I'll put you in the crevice of the rock. You can look at my back, but don't look at my face. You know, you're going to die. I want to protect you. You can't look at me. Um, so that, it's like that down power line. It's so, so powerful. And, you know, with electricity, you know, you, you, I once touched an electric fence by accident. I know it was electric. And I remember what it felt like when you feel that surge that vault go through you and all of your organs like go up into your throat. And I think that, I, I feel like that's what the prophet feels all the time, you know, because they're touching the wire, but they're not grounded. And, um, and that's a little bit of insanity. And if you can touch that and then let go and survive, um, it's, mm -hmm. it's a powerful experience. Okay. Um, well, how do, you, do you think Jeremiah was happy at the, uh, the last day of his life? Did he look at his life as a failure or as a success? He witnessed the destruction, but he also witnessed the people surviving the destruction the day after. I think he probably um, was satisfied that he fulfilled his mission. Mm -hmm. I think that we today, um, we want to live our lives happy. And that's an American ideal, mm -hmm. right? We're the only country that has in its constitution um, pursuit of happiness as a value. Most countries don't have that as a value. Right. Um, but if we are, but there's a difference between happiness and contentment and satisfaction. And contentment and satisfactions are also really good things. You might not see the res, you might not see the end result of what you put into motion, um, but you can be satisfied that you played an essential role in getting us there. Great, very nice. Um, who else has the mic? Who's next? I got it. Douglas. In response to Rabbi Feinstein's first question, you called Jeremiah the Jewish Jesus. And <laughs> I, I, I was looking at the first stuff that you read where it said, before I created you in the womb, I selected you, which seems sort of more like a Christian idea that you might find in the Gospel of John than you would in a Jewish text. Could you comment on that? Yeah, that just sort of came out. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, uh, what, did, what did I mean by that, Ed? Suffering servant. Yeah. A guy who takes upon himself the fate of his people and carries their, their, their pain and their, and their brokenness in himself as a way of trying to absolve them of the sin. I mean, you have, Im you have a lot of imagery in Jeremiah, you have the imagery of wearing the yoke which is very much like carrying the cross. Um, you have, you know, and Jeremiah, of course, predates those Christian notions. Um, you have the idea of, um, of being the enemy of the government, you know, and uh, you have the image of, um, of yes, of the, of, the suffering, of the suffering servant. Yeah. How did he get selected out of the womb? Mm. That's right. That is interesting. Yeah. That God selected him even before no, he was so born. It's the other way around, Douglas. You have these texts, right? These texts, the, the, the Christian fathers who, the Christian fathers who both witnessed and experienced the life and ministry and death of Jesus, and then who wrote his story in the generations following his life and death, right? They lived this. They knew this by heart. This was their mamalushan. This was their internal language. So they shaped the narrative of Jesus of Nazareth to fit the prophecies that they were familiar and you, with. And there are a lot, that, you know, in a lot of the prophets, you have Jonah was in the whale for three days, just like Jesus was, uh, you know, Perfect. dead for three days. You have the archetypal story is really the Isaac story. So Isaac going up the mountain carrying the wood of his own sacrifice on his back. Um, and at the end, oh, father, why have you forsaken me? The father is Abraham. His literal father has forsaken him and tried to sacrifice him. And in the Quran, 
Um, it's not Isaac who goes up the mountain. It's Ishmael who goes up the mountain. So if you have all of the Abrahamic traditions um, have that story, the Christian version ends with death, not with the, the hand being stopped. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, please. Yes, there's a piece of this puzzle that I don't understand. Uh, we're introduced to the high priest who is the Holy of Holies in the uh, Temple of Solomon, and we have a prophet and we have a king. Mm -hmm. Has the prophet, Jeremiah, replaced the Holy of Holies in the uh, Temple of Solomon? Where is that person's uh, role in terms of this whole understanding of what's happening mm. uh, to the city of, of Jerusalem or Good. Judea? Good question. Mm. Do you want to try you that? You know, go ahead. You want to go? Well, I, the, the, the priesthood and the prophets were often um, at odds with each other. And so the priest, the priest is um, organized religion and um, is, I'm going to turn this no, over. You have, yeah. What you have is, we have Jeremiah's book, right? We also actually have the priest book. It's the called Leviticus. Levi Leviticus right. right. Now, if, if you were to ask the priest, what do you think of this Jeremiah fellow? He would say, you know, this crazy kid, he's a kid, right? Shows up, makes all this noise, messes up Yom Kippur, right? We had to have the guards escort him out because he's a pain in the neck, right? We are doing what God asked us to do. We are offering the sacrifices with precision. We are keeping the laws of purity with precision. We are making the temple just what God asked us to do. And because of that, because of that, that's why the world keeps turning, why the sun comes up in the morning. And not just that, but because of Jerusalem's special status as the place of God's temple, we are invulnerable. And, we, and there are other stories that, that show the, um, you have the story, the origin story of, Sam, of Samuel. Mm -hmm. And so Samuel's a young boy, and he's in the temple that where Eli is the priest, and God keeps calling to Samuel, and Eli doesn't recognize it. Eli's like, you know, what, what's going on? You know, so you have this, this um, right, the dogmatic following of, of rules. Um, there's even in the Talmud, there's an amazing story where they talk about how far the priesthood has strayed um, from, from moral Judaism in that you have, they would rush to be the first one in the morning to clear the ashes on the altar because that was a sacred duty and everybody wanted to get there first to the point where at one point two priests are rushing up the ramp to the altar and one takes a knife and stabs the other priest on the ramp. And the, all the priests come and rush around him. They take the knife out and because the priest hasn't died from the wound, they say the instrument is still kosher, right? It would have been rendered unkosher at the priest, but that's how how focused they are on the letter of the law instead of the ethics behind it. Right, so it was a question of the, whether uh, God yeah. wants the, the, whether God sees an intrinsic value in the sacrificial worship, or whether the sacrificial worship is a symbol of the inner life of the people. The prophets saw the sacrifices as worthy only so much as they were indicative of the inner life and the ethical life of the people. And the priest said, no, this is what God wants. And those two, the tension between formal, the formal, formal ritual and the internal kavanah of the heart is one of the tensions that forms, that, that, will, that will accompany Jewish people all through history. Norm, you have the mic? Yes. Uh, Hi. Apropos of the same, it seems when you talk about the mercy that Jeremiah uh, put forth and versus the law, isn't that the same argument the Christians have had about Jews forever? That, that we're the people of the book and they're the people of the heart. Yeah, yeah, except that it's our book, you know, and <laughs> Jeremiah's in our book. So the heart and the book live together in the, the heart and the book live together in our faith. And I don't know if you know this, but Christians also have their forms. Right? Go, go across the street. Quite beautiful, by the way, their forms, but they, have their, they also have their law and their forms and their ways of doing things. In fact, they have a guy in Rome who makes the rules, and unlike any rabbi, he declares himself infallible, 
right? Now, God, I wish I could do that, I, you know. I couldn't because I'm married to my wife and it would be impossible for me to declare infallibility. She'd make sure that I was dispelled of that illusion right away. Um, but the idea that, that religion always has form and religion always has its inner turmoil and the conflict between the two is the driving creativity of all religion, ours, theirs, every religion. You can't live with bo without, without both but, but the tension between the two is alive in every living religion. And I, I would just add that in Judaism, I think uh, what, what may, maybe others don't understand is that law is love, that the Torah is a love letter to the people. It's, a, it's an ethical blueprint for how to, a so society can become better. And so um, it is, it's God's loving gift to us to have law. Law is not cold. It's actually about protecting people, about justice, about um, chala. About braided, chala. braided chala. About braided chala. Braided too. chala. Love. There's braided chala. We'll get one more, okay? Mark down. Um, the uh, Babylonians are coming, Nebuchadnezzar is coming to invade uh, Jerusalem, Judea. And uh, Jeremiah is always telling him, surrender, give up. Right. And it's it's treason, in a sense. It's yeah, treason. It and it goes on from there. Later on, he's doing the same thing. Surrender, don't fight them. Could it be that Jeremiah was a secret agent for Nebuchadnezzar? <laughs> well, that's what some of them, that's why he was imprisoned. I mean, they... And Robert they... Mueller came to investigate him. I mean, <laughs> what if I was a collusion with the Babylonian government, you see? So go ahead, please. Right. Well, the word Hebrew comes from... Uh, you know, can be translated as, as border crosser, you know, one who passes over. And, you know, so yeah, the people at the time thought, did think he was treasonous. Um, but his deeper message may be uh, that it's not about borders and, and land and us versus them. It's, it's about our own ethics and learning and, God, and being God's partners which can happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would put it in a slightly, in a secular way, just because that's how I tend to read these texts. When we had sovereignty, which was under David and Solomon, it was in a moment when the two great empires of Mesopotamia and Egypt were both quiescent. They were both down. So there was room for people in our neighborhood to rise up and take some power. But what happened was at a certain point, um, 200 years after, after King David dies, the Mesopotamians begin to rise. You have the first great Mesopotamian empires. You have Assyria, then you have Babylon, then you have Persia. And what the prophet, what the prophet Jeremiah was able to see, because he read the New York Times every morning, <laughs> was that we were no longer going to be able to claim sovereignty because the empires wouldn't let us. So we were going to have to figure out how do you live as a Jew how do you live as a Jew in a neighborhood which someone else is going to have hegemony over? How do you live as somebody else's colony? Now, if you define yourself as a citizen of a state and the king as sovereign, and you put all of your eggs in that basket and you say, that's my pride. God is on the side of my king. God protects Israel. And, you say, and that's your identity that's, you're, that's fatal, that's suicide. Because eventually, if it wasn't gonna be Assyria, it would be Babylon, it would be Persia, it would be Greece, it would be Rome, it would be, someone's gonna come and conquer you, and that would be the end of the Jewish people. Jeremiah, I think, had the remarkable political instinct to say, it's time to redefine the identity of the Jewish people. We're no longer gonna be a state with a government and sovereignty. We're gonna be a covenantal community dedicated to what Rabbi Zoe just told us, to, to learning, to ethical living, to the cultivation of righteousness, to a life of Torah. And if we're a covenantal community, we can live under any political circumstances as long as they leave us alone. And that, I think, was Jeremiah's political genius. And that's what he tried to teach the Jewish people. Now, in the moment that he did it, he was a traitor because he was giving up what was so precious to the people's sovereignty. From the vast perspective of history that we get to have, we can say he was a prophet. <laughs> he, 
He was pressing it because he could see that that was the way we had to exist. Otherwise, we never would have made it through history. And then there's one little, last little piece of this, then I'll let you, which is that worked until 1897. And in 1897, there came another prophet whose name was Theodore Herzl, who, by the way, was also possessed. I mean, lunatic guy who saw that modern life was different than ancient and medieval life. And there was nothing we could do that would allow them to leave us alone. They weren't going to leave us alone. We could even convert. We could become Lutheran and they wouldn't leave us alone because Hitler's definition of Jew was you had one Jewish grandmother. You could be a Lutheran priest and they'd throw you in the ovens of Auschwitz. So Theodor Herzl said, it's time to reverse the process and recover sovereignty because under these circumstances, sovereignty is the only way that the Jewish people is gonna survive in the world. So the arc of Jewish political history runs from the genius of the prophet Jeremiah to the genius of the prophet Theodor Herzl. And now we live 70 years in the new age. But we had all those years to, to perfect weakness and powerlessness as our, as our defense. Now we have to figure out how to live with power. And we're still not really good at it. Right. We're still learning how to do it. You get the last word. Well, OK, thank you. Please. <laughs> you know, they say that, um, that there are two responses when you feel that you're in danger. One is fight, and one is flight. But in a lot of times in Jewish history, neither of those were actually options. Um, to fight meant you die, and to run meant you died. And so there's another, there's another thing that people can do. There's fight, and there's flight, and there's flow. And that's what Jeremiah introduced, that, that you, you flow, that you ride the tide, that you survive, and that you not only survive, you thrive. You plant vineyards. You plant gardens. You marry. That was his advice in the, in the letter, that you don't just get by, but you actually build lives. You build homes. You plant roots. And you go with it. And over time, there's influence and there's, there's life. And it's a, an incredibly powerful, powerful message. And I do, I do think that when um, Theodore Herzl, uh, that Theodore Herzl became like Jeremiah, that he had a vision at the Dreyfus trial, that he like, saw what the future was going to be and was seen as a madman by so many. Mm -hmm. Um, but definitely change change the arc the arc of history. Thanks so much for being Thank with us. Thank you so tonight. much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Friday nights, Rimonim, Shabbos mornings, Torah, Sunday morning, Rabbi Suzomu, next Wednesday, Rabbi Walpi. Please come back. Oh Good night. Goodness.